I'll present you today about action okay. perception, okay? And action perception in the everyday life is just everywhere. We are continuously seeing people moving their bodies, moving their feet, moving their hands, interacting with objects, and we are extremely good at perceiving these movements, predicting them, anticipating them, interpreting them. We can interact with people synchronously, we can almost immediately understand what people are doing, and we can infer a lot of information, such as information about their mental states or about the most likely outcome of their actions from their kinematics. We can, for instance, see that someone is working happily or working sadly, for instance. And in this study, we try to understand whether these abilities rely on a process of motor simulation. Okay? These questions might be surprising to some of you. And this is because we all know that traditionally, action perception is not a function of the motor system. Action perception is assumed to rely on computations occurring in a perceptual system, a conceptual system, an inferential system, and so on. But the most important point is that despite the motor system can be activated by different mechanisms for different reasons, such as for um, observational motor learning, for instance, it does not contribute to perception. Okay? However, this view has been challenged by a whole series of motor simulation theories of action perception, which, despite their very numerous differences, all assume that very efficient perception of movements requires a process of unconscious covert imitation of the observed movement, which is called motor simulation. And by that way, by motorically simulating the observed movement, the observer is able to retrieve knowledge he has about these movements and actions when he himself executes them, such as, whoa, what are the body biomechanical constraints that influence the execution of this movement? Or what's my goal when I myself execute these movements and so on? And in this study, we tested this hypothesis. To do so, what we did was quite straightforward. We just tested the ability to perceive and understand upper limb actions in, in, in individuals who are born without upper limbs or I would say very short-term upper limbs. So the logic is the following. Because these individuals have no upper limb motor representations or no motor representations of upper limb movement that they can use to motorically simulate upper limb actions, then the expectation of the motor simulation theories is that their performance should somewhat differ from the performance of control participants in at least the tasks that assess action perception uh, aspects of action perception that really require a motor simulation. And this is the prediction that we tested across a range of experiments. In the very first experiments, we uh, asked whether we need a motor simulation simply to be able to understand very efficiently observed actions. To uh, answer this question, we simply asked our participants to view video clips of an actress pantomiming a polym actions, such as combing oneself or playing the violin. And we asked our participants to name each of these actions 14 different times in a gradual unmasking paradigm, where the video clips were first shown for only 330 milliseconds, and then uh, the videos had, had an increasing duration by steps of 165 milliseconds until more than 2.5 seconds. And for each participant that you can see here on the x-axis, with the displasix in red, the controls in gray, and the mean of the control participants in green, we have simply calculated the mean number of steps of demasking that they needed to identify an action. And as you can see here, it's very clear that the displasix do not need more steps of demasking to identify an action. They are not less efficient than the control participants. And from these results, we conclude that no, it does not. We do not need motor simulation to be efficient to recognize an action. However, it might be that motor simulation might be particularly important when it comes to recognize actions perceived in very difficult perceptual conditions. To test this hypothesis, we showed our participants video clips showing an actor reduced to only 12 light dots originally attached to his main joints. And we, once again, presented them with 20 of such video clips and we asked them to name them, to recognize the actions. For each participant, here again shown on the x-axis with the same color code, we simply calculated the percentage of correct responses. And as you can see on the right, two of the dysplastic people, despite they are completely unable to motorically simulate this movement, were just among the best participants. So I think we can conclude that, no, it does not 
We do not need motor simulation to be able to recognize these actions, even under very difficult perceptual conditions. Another possibility is that we need motor simulation not to recognize actions, but to learn to recognize actions. Okay, let's test that. To test that, we ask our participants to memorize 21 video clips of an actress performing meaningless gestures with her upper limbs. Like that, or like that. Then we ask them to recognize these 21 video clips among 21 other video clips showing very similar movements. The performance of the participants, once again on the x-axis, and simply, simply the sensitivity uh, D prime index on the y-axis. And as you can see, it's very clear that, once again, the performance of the dysplastic participants did not differ from the performance of the control participants. So it looks like, no, we do not need motor simulation to be very efficient at learning to recognize new actions. Yet, another hypothesis is that we might need motor simulation, in particular when it comes to be able to make uh, inferences based on the very fine grain analysis of someone else's movement. This was a very interesting, uh, I think, hypothesis, and we used two experiments to test it. In the first experiment, participants viewed video clips of an actor throwing a basketball. The video clip was interrupted at the time the ball leaves the hand of the actor, and we asked our participants to use the available kinematic information to predict the outcome of the shot. In a second experiment, our participants were viewing video clips of an actor lifting a large box, or just of the hand of the actor lifting a small box. And in 50% of these video clips, the actor was in fact uh, misinformed about the real weight of the box. So they were told, for instance, please go lift the box, it's 18 kilos. And actually the box was only 15 kilos. So they have a kind of uh, postural readjustment during their lifting phase. And we asked our participants, please look carefully at these video clips and try to uh, detect from the kinematic of the lifting phase whether the actor has been or not deceived about the weight of the box. Once again, for all the participants, we took the D prime sensitivity index. And once again, the performance did not differ from the performance of the control participants. This is the result you can see here for the basketball free shot uh, task with one of the dysplasics being even in the four best participants. This is also what you can see here in the two conditions of the uh, deception detection task, let's say. So it looks like, no, we don't need motor simulation to account for this ability. But still, motor simulation might be particularly important when it comes to explain very basic aspects of perception, such as, for instance, our tendency to systematically perceive the position of a moving body part slightly ahead of its real position, which is called a perceptual anticipation bias, or to account for how this bias is modulated by implicit knowledge we have about the body biomechanics. To test this hypothesis, we used a task in which we know that participants' performance can reveal these two perceptual biases. I have a lot to say about this task, but it's actually quite simple. Participants were seeing two kinds of series of three pictures. One series is this, for, is this one, tack, 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 inducing the perception of a movement that would be very difficult to continue along the same trajectory or tack, tack, tack. Perception of a movement that would be very easy to continue along the same trajectory. Very importantly, these two series end with the same, very same uh, target last picture. So each time, in both conditions, the last picture is the following, showing always the hand in the same position. And then participants see a last picture, a probe, and their task is to decide whether the probe show the hand at the very same position as the, hand, as the position of the hand on the target Okay? There are different kind of probes. Obviously, one of these probes is the same as the target. So they have to say, oh yes, the hand is at the very same position as it was at the hand of the inducing stimuli. This is the exact same. Two other probes are false. And these two false show the hand slightly displaced away from the body. Okay? Because they are displaced, because the hand is displaced away from the body, it will be called up, up, a backward probe in the easy condition. Why? Because in dizzy condition, the hand moves this way, and then if the hand position on the probe is there, the position is shifted backward along the hand trajectory. But it will be called a forward probe in the awkward condition, because in the awkward condition, the hand stops here, and if the hand is displaced away from the body, it is displaced forward along the trajectory of the hand. The two other probes showed the hand displaced toward the body. So for the same reasons, these probes will be called forward probes 
in the easy condition and backward flows in the awkward condition. I really hope you follow me. Okay, that's perfect. And expected, what are the expected results in this task? In this task, typically in the easy condition, so when people are seeing the hand moving this way, they tend to see the position of the hand shifted a bit forward along its trajectory. So they respond more often same. Oh, this is the same. When the hand is moved forward, and when the hand is moved backward, so for forward and for back, backward props. But this effect is constrained by knowledge we have about how the body can move. So when they see the hand moving like that, they know that the hand is very unlikely to go further away. So this bias disappears or is significantly uh, smaller. So to understand whether these two biases rely on motor simulation, we just use this task with the people born without a problem. And as you can see here, each of these individuals had the very same two biases. They all had a significantly larger number of same responses for forward than for backward probes in the easy condition. And this bias was in all participants significantly smaller for the, in the awkward condition. And actually we replicated this finding in two further experiments using continuous motion, different kind of movements, and more control stimuli. So I feel pretty confident in saying that now we don't need motor simulation, actually, to account for these two perceptual biases. So you will not be surprised by my conclusion, which is that efficient perception, anticipation, prediction, learning, comprehension of actions do not seem to require motor simulation. OK, I would like to thank all these people who contributed in some ways to uh, these experiments. I couldn't see the, the temporal order, so we, maybe we have these four. We could see four, we have four questions of uh, one and a half minutes each. Then maybe uh, we start clockwise. Then, from my perspective. So this was so interesting. Thank you. I noticed that in um, many of the tasks, the the participants with aplasia actually performed better than your controls, and I'm wondering if you think that might have to do with their their visual experience and they're performing these visual tasks based on that visual experience and likewise whether if you did some sort of stimulation of visual cortex whether they perform you know like tms or something to interfere yeah. with the processing whether they would perform more poorly mm. this is an extremely interesting question but i will have to uh, disappoint you because actually we have no differences between the dysplasic and the control so i think it's not correct to say that in some tasks the dysplasics perform better I think it's more correct to say that they perform just like everybody else. When we use group statistics instead of individual participant statistics, the mean are always extremely similar, the variants are extremely similar, perceptual biases are extremely similar. So I just think it's more correct to say they are the same. Do you have a prediction about the visual, about visual stimulation, whether they might be using another modality? So, so I think. One other way to conclude this study would be, oh, maybe everybody needs motor simulation except the dysplastics. Maybe they have a different strategy, as you yeah. say. But I think uh, if this is the case, we have to assume that they have developed alternative strategies, and we have no idea what they could be, that could explain in all these different tasks, testing all these different aspects of perception, that they have the same speed, same accuracy, same perceptual biases. We would also have to explain why the controls cannot and do not develop these strategies. And we would have to assume that motor simulation plays a role in our brains. And I have no evidence supporting any of these possibilities. So I think it's just more safe to assume that this conclusion can be generalized to everybody. Okay, I think uh, Gary first, uh, in the middle there. Then we have Marlene and... So I don't want to be a defender of motor simulation, but everything that we've learned so far today about today and yesterday about uh, blind individuals is that they recruit the same areas in largely similar ways as sighted individuals. So what I would be convinced by is if you were to show that um, were you to put people in a scanner or either these participants or others and the, the others who have all limbs fire up, you know, premotor cortex and motor cortex, and these guys don't. It's yeah. very, very likely these guys are recruiting exactly the same neural substrates that are controlling, after all, the rest of their body mm -hmm. and are using those. So I'm not entirely sure that um, one can really rule that out because, after all, I don't actually have to do motor simulation to understand an event that I'm looking at. 
but I may nonetheless be recruiting those motoric areas. I can watch the Olympics, I can't do high jump, I can't do synchronized swimming. But I watch it and I'm great, but I bet my motor cortex is, mm -hmm. is firing up. Yes, I, I think this is a very interesting question in itself. Do these people and will these people activate the same brain regions, same brain network when they see these opening movements that they've never done, that they are not able to do? But in my mind, this question is quite independent uh, to the very functional question we were asking in this study, which is, do you or not need to be able to covertly perform the very same movements is the movement that you observe to be able to perceive and interpret actions. And I think this is legitimate, I see you said no, but I think this is legitimate to ask this question that way because this is the way this hypothesis is traced in one big part of the literature. Now we can go further, we can always go further and we are currently going in this direction, but uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that we don't need this functionally defined motor simulation procedure to support action perception. So um, I think I have a similar kind of comment to, to other people uh, about whether these patients could be doing these tasks in different ways. But in addition, the question is whether these tasks, even in normals, need M1 or how much they rely on what you're calling motor simulation, which really could be relatively late. You know, so these patients, if I'm not mistaken, they have, they have, they're missing their hand rep and arm representation in M1, but presumably many other aspects of their motor planning processes earlier pro are still intact. And in fact, I think there's some work by Angela Sergu's group, I, I, I don't know if she's still here, but that show that motor imagery in these patients is normal in, in, um, in uh, amputees is normal in the face of abnormal later hand-specific M1 representation. So to use these as the test sample for abnorm abnormalities in uh, motor processing may not be, may not be a good case because uh -huh. they're intact in these very processes that are needed to do the tasks that you used. Well, I think there is one question which is, do we need to recruit some part of the motor system or some part of the brain, which is used to plan movements to support our ability to perceive action. And this is a very interesting question. I think it's like slightly different from the question we tried to answer in this study. So these results are limited to the way I phrase the prediction that we tested. And I, once again, I feel pretty confident that we can say that. I wouldn't say that, that from these results we can say that non-structures in the motor system can contribute to perception. It, it, it may well be. but. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I want to say about that. I have a very quick question. Um, and that is, you argue that there's no difference between the groups. But in fact, when you look at your distribution on a subject-by-subject -subject basis, it looks to me more than chance or coin flip that uh, some of your individuals fall in the lower range. And moreover, across these different tasks, sometimes it's like subject two and three, sometimes it's five and one. And so my question is, uh, is there something very subtle in your data that um, requires additional explanation? Nothing subtle that we have been able to find, at the least. Um, I would say that for sure we have um, had a look at that and the output of the statistical analysis that we performed to know if the variance of the dysphasic participants in each task was different from the variance of the performance of the controls, but also whether the variance of the performance of each individual was different across tasks. For instance, one dysphasic could be the best and then the worst and so on. If these variances were different from the variances that we found in the control group, it was never the case, except in this task, which is the point light display naming task, in which we add a different variance in the dysplasics people and in the control people, with some of the dysplasics among the worst and two among the best participants. This is something we would like to try to explain, but we don't really have any evidence that speaks to that issues right now. So this is probably something that we will uh, continue to investigate further in the future. Okay, last question to you, Sharon. So if you go back to your conclusion slide. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Um, and I, my, my comment slash question uh, is um, not entirely original among the comments you've just heard, but I appreciated that you didn't put a period at the end of this sentence um, because it suggests that there's a continuation, um, which is do not require a process of motor simulation in people who have never had limbs. Um, and I do think, you know, I, I take your point about parsimony, it's good when you, when you got it, um, but I, I do think that at least many sensory motor theories of conceptual representation, including action concepts, um, uh, contend that the way you learn about something affects what kind of simulation you do when you retrieve that information. Mm -hmm. And so given that they didn't learn about this through experience with their limbs, I don't think the prediction is that they would be affected. Now, you're right, the task for you or for you know, people in the room who disagree with you would be to find evidence that they're doing something differently than people who learned with limbs. But that doesn't mean it would be a difference in performance. So it might be that the similarity space of action representations has been changed mm -hmm. in a way, but I don't think it makes a performance difference. Um, so it would be good to complete that sentence um, and with the limitation of you really are describing this in people who learned without limbs. I would love to complete that sentence as well. Like saying, but you know, by the way, motor simulation is very useful, or having had motor experience in performing an action is very useful for point, point, point. I just haven't been able to find any evidence for any function of this. But I think this idea yet. of looking at for some neural evidence or some similarity evidence, you know, non-neural similarity evidence this would be a, a really good way to go. Probably something we should like look at in the future. In the future, thank you. And great talk. Thanks. But, uh, no, I just wanted to, to add a comment to Sharon's comment, uh, and that is, uh, um, as Sharon pointed out, uh, some of us believe that uh, one should have positive evidence for theoretical claims. Uh, and what uh, has been shown here is that if you use the tasks that have been claimed to require motor simulation to be performed, the answer is no, they do not require it. So if, if that's the case, so, no, so wait, so there are two conclusions. One, the one that Sharon pointed out, that is you complete that sentence, it is not required um, uh, by people who have no limbs, and furthermore, the evidence that has been cited in support of motor simulation cannot be cited as such, correct? because for the reasons that we've just shown. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks to all the winners.